Okay, so our next speaker is Yangqin Jia. So Yangqin is actually uh, the author of CAFE, which is one of the most uh, distributed uh, machine learning framework on your network. Uh, he's been a colleague at Google for a few years, and now he leads large-scale AI platform at Facebook. So um, thanks so much. And it's, uh, it's uh, such a great day with like, all, the, all those very nice talks. And uh, this gives me a lot of pressure, because it's like uh, after this long uh, series talks, what uh, is left for me to say? And uh, then I started remembering this conversation that I had with all our you know, awesome hardware colleagues. Um, they constantly ask me, or a bunch of other ML folks, what do you guys want? And often we come back with, we don't know, because we kind of throw ourselves out of window every like year or half a year. And then I was like, well, um, maybe it's a good place for me to basically chat a little bit about you know, what kind of things we do in general, some high level pictures of the practice that we, we run deep learning methods, and then basically see you know, like what kind of challenges we have and try to turn around the table and basically just be the whining customer that basically talks about what we want. And hopefully that stirs more um, you know, like thoughts and you know, innovative ideas from the really awesome hardware community. So I'm going to be basically just talk about what we do with machine learning today, with the characteristics of the current ML in production, what kind of things we do for training, deployment, and things like that, and then kind of think a little, well, basically describe a little bit what kind of research directions or engineering directions that we think will be interesting to look at that are underestimated or under uh, invested these days. Now. I have to kind of like advertise Facebook a little bit. So at Facebook, we do this tool train using Cafe2 and PyTorch as uh, the um, product system and the research system to achieve some um, really flexible experimentations on the PyTorch side and very solid productions on the Cafe2 side. And as you know, frameworks nowadays are becoming really thin wrappers around a bunch of very abundant library of different stuff, you know, ranging from reading things from databases to doing the core math libraries to doing the communication between the networks and things like that, and it involves a lot of low-level um, <laughs> languages such as CUDA, MetaWorb, and Geo, things to actually implement all those detailed maths. Um, at a 30,000 feet level, basically what we do for deep learning at Facebook is we use it to drive almost all systems. You know, computer vision is apparently one big application. Translation and speech recognition using RNNs and LSTMs is something that's really popular. In a lot of our ranking systems, we also adopt machine learning methods to, make, to do like nice recommendations of cute cats and things like that, which is what you see at Facebook. And you know, like an oversimplified view from an engineering side is that we basically come up with a model and we train those models with one way or another, and then we deploy it onto a large cluster and then we profit. But we try to make the engineers as much as easy, oh, as, e uh, like as easy as possible to use those kind of approaches. And uh, as of mid last year, what we're collecting is that about 25% of, Facebook, of the Facebook engineers are actually using machine learning to some, ex to some capacity. And sort of, you know, like some of them basically train models that are pre-written and they basically uh, like rerun those kind of things for products. Some of them basically do an um, actual model explorations and um, some of them actually, you know, like do more research side things. In general, in total, about 600K models were trained per month. Some of them were iterated, some of them were new, and, uh, but that's kind of like the scale that we have been operating with machine learning. The models that we, use, that, that we run are mostly categorized into three parts. One is MLPs, which is basically those kind of models that are pretty much basically matrix application. Some of them are really dense, some of them are sparse matrix applications that we can talk about a bit later. CNN for images and videos is a pre pretty big uh, application, and then RNNs is yet another one for current models such as translation, language understanding, and, uh, and uh, like new directions such as RA and things like that. And sometimes they cross each other. You might have a CNN model that produces some image features that gets fed into an MLP for ranking and things like that, but basically they boil down to these three different categories. Now, for tr yeah, so. the sense of um, distribution of where compute cycles, computer sources go to each one of these models, like roughly? Um, I think it also depends on, you know, like uh, the different applications. So for example, in like for all those recommendation systems, it's pretty much MLPs, and for images, it's pretty much CNNs. I actually honestly don't know the, uh, the proportion of like this versus that. Yeah. Um, so for to train, to train those kind of models, we pretty much always use distributed training. And uh, in fact, you know, these kind of models, especially machine learning models with like stochastic gradient descent are actually pretty nice with uh, uh, distributed training. To take ImageNet, for example, we recently published a paper about training ImageNet in an hour. 
And uh, to put things in perspective, back in 2012, when Alex wrote his first seminal AlexNet paper, the training time on one GPU is about uh, like six days or 144 hours. Today is one hour, of course, with a lot of GPUs. And what we found is that you know, like um, by um, hiding the communication under the computation part, we're actually able to achieve a very nice scaling factor that is almost linear to the number of uh, to the number of uh, GPUs that we uh, that we use. And it used to be that there is a big problem, which is you know, when we're doing more and more distributed training, to maintain efficiency on each GPU, we're actually needing to have a reasonable sized batch size, uh, 32 or something like that. And as you go larger and larger with mini batches, then often the convergence speed uh, starts to hurt mathematically because larger mini batches don't really work very well with larger learning rates and things like that. Now, um, in our recent paper, we basically um, proposed some heuristics and uh, talked about you know, like how we were able to um, scale up the batch size effectively to 8K or something like that without hurting too much of the performance. And we kind of found that similar trends like applies as long as we do careful parameter, um, like have a parameter search, and it applies to a lot of models that we care about today. Now, say we have a model, and I want to basically deploy it into different uh, platforms. We do a bunch of things before we basically, you know, like put it into products. First of all, one thing we do is that, you know, for a lot of these operations, then we found that there are, uh, there are key operations such as convolution and machine application that are taking most of the time. So we took quite a lot of care in writing optimized runtime for those kind of things. And for example, for CNNs, it's pretty much convolution. And uh, um, it seems that like in a lot of papers, people are still talking about using image to call or basically the lowering approach by expanding the image into a matrix and then do machine application for that. And it came really popular back in 2012 and 2013, but honestly, guys, don't use it. And there are newer methods such as Vinograd that are way better. And uh, what we found is that in actual practice, uh, well, like practical applications, then um, by using Vinograd, we often get you know multiple x of speed ups. So those kind of things help really a lot. And we sometimes do like an Atlas type tuning to find the best engine to run different operators. The other thing is, you know, like we kind of uh, the good thing about machine learning is um, it's basically defining a bunch of math that we can run on different devices, and on phones and things like that. Basically, where there are GPUs available, we actually utilize different devices to basically like translate a model from the CPU um, part to the metal part, and basically run exactly the same math just with different I/O assumptions and different runtime assumptions, um, converting the whole graph over, and that gives us a pretty nice speed up usually. Um, the other part is, you know, like um, often when we're running d deep learning models, if we are kind of like running things really carelessly, then every layer is basically creating more chunks of memory on top of each other. And then um, we can definitely do like a very dynamic memory allocation to, um, to basically like save the memory consumptions. But what happens is in mobile platforms, often, you know, like a dynamic memory management is not that great. So we kind of do approaches such as, you know, like static memory analysis to find out what kind of uh, buffers we need and then basically like reuse those kind of buffers and reorganize the graph to basically um, use things like such as uh, things like a ping pong buffer to statically reduce the amount of memory that's needed in running those networks. And now this is an overly simplified view, but in more complex networks such as Google Net, then what we get is you know like um, a, like similar to those kind of different parts in Google Net, we have different uh, set of buffers that are taking care of the different matrices or tensors that we need in this execution. In general, basically, you know, like the things we do are achieving these kind of effects. So um, this is like the what we do for a neural style transfer that's actually already in like all these Facebook uh, apps that you have today. Now, when we started doing all those, uh, what, when we started exploring the opportunity of running things on mobile, then um, on the left, that's like what we were able to achieve, a tiny, teeny window trying to create a Lego style effect. And uh, by, you know, like really carefully looking at the, the every engineering aspect of it, using GPUs, using better models, using better runtime, we're actually able to run it at uh, 720p or actually now 128p, uh, 1080p, um, Resolution, real time, and then at the same time, we'll be able to, you know, like do a bunch of other things, such as using face recognition to find the best time to take a shot and things like that. So it's pretty cool. All right. So um, the thing that we're doing today is pretty much basically, you know, like boils down to these kind of effects. And we usually deploy models that are static graphs. We talk a lot about, you know, having dynamic controls in our uh, like uh, models and things like that, which is particularly useful for a bunch of new research directions such as RL. But uh, honestly speaking, in products, we often still have static graphs that can be basically run with, you know, like all those kind of computations laid out. Models change very slowly. We sometimes uh, like iterate a model or like actually change the actual model uh, like like every week or things like that. But they get retrained very frequently with new data and things like that. 
Often it's possible to use a large scale training and we kind of observe a pattern of return of, uh, of like the, the return of HPC with all those kind of, you know, all reduced patterns and, uh, and, and high well, uh, scientific computation patterns. The optimizations we do today are often at the operator uh, and graph level, such as you know, tuning the computation engine of different operators, changing the device that runs these kind of things, and also to do memory tunings at an operator level. And that's what we are today. And now, on to the runs. The thing that we found is, you know, like, I'm kind of like, I'm trying to formulate them into four categories, and I jokingly call it the Mocha challenges. Memories, operators, compilers, and arithmetic of all those kind of networks and all those kind of machine learning models. And let's talk about it one after one. Um, machine learning is often kind of, you know, like in contrast to a lot of the belief, we are actually um, finding a lot of memory bound uh, like applications similar to what Kerry talked about just now. And there's this large category of models that are involving very, um, you know, sparse um, embedding tables that are, you know, like essentially just like little computation and a lot of the computations. And even gem and gem v sometimes gets really expensive. And uh, as chips get, get, get faster and faster, memory becomes more and more, and more of an issue. So embedding tables, and I actually already saw Scott nodding over there. And for a lot of recommendation systems, what we have is conceptually a matrix application but with a very huge dense embedding table with very sparse input comes in. The sparse input is basically, you know, like sometimes tens of thousands or millions of dimensions, but with only tens, hundreds, or a few hundred of these values non-zero. The dense embedding tables then is basically a matrix of size, like say a couple million times 10 or 100. And those kind of, kind of patterns gets, you know, like basically talked about on, in like Google from the wide and dense paper and in Amazon, in Scott's talk and things like that. And, and what happens is basically we're essentially just uh, ac randomly accessing those kind of rows in these dense embedding tables. And you might say, hey, we might be able to, you know, like cache those kind of things and things like that. The sparse imports are often very random, meaning that we don't even have cache hits. The whole thing is just a huge memory bank that we need to make it faster. Now, even for those kind of things where we are running dense matrix applications such as an FC layer or a Flickernetta layer, then the problem is that the weight matrix is often of good shape, like say like a thousand times a thousand. The input is tricky because it's basically the batch size times a thousand. Now, in an online fashion where the requests are coming in in a stream, um, we can basically wait a little bit to get you know like a non-trivial amount of um, um, items for us to run in a batch. But often, um, you know, like sometimes it's not that um, it's like not that uh, that ideal because we need to also um, um, make sure that the, uh, the the latency of the services are like are met. So essentially, you know, like we're having smaller and smaller batch sizes in many cases. And as we know, you know, like that basically means that by reading in the same amount of weights, you're actually only able to apply it to a smaller number of computation and making it really challenging if we don't have a faster memory. And as if things are uh, not uh, challenging enough, you know, like the processors, um, awesomely from NVIDIA and, and folks, are actually making great progress in uh, making sure that we are having higher and higher computation powers. On the other hand, um, basically the memory is not really catching up that fast. Volta compared to Pascal is five times fa faster in uh, computation, but the HBM2 bandwidth is probably only a, a moderate 1.2 to 1.6 times faster. Mm -hmm. And not to mention that we still have that awesome PCIe that is running really fast and giving us a whopping six gigabyte of speed per second speed. So once we take into consideration those, we're like, we're scared. We want a faster memory communication and please give, us, give it to us. Otherwise, you know, like it's a little bit ch challenging to use that 120 teraflops over there. It, I'm sure that some folks are already kind of like smiling because uh, you might be like, you know, you are just rediscovering the same effect of CPUs versus memory because it's always that the processors get so fast, the RAM is not getting fast enough, the disk is getting, getting even slower. And we actually see these kind of constraints already. So when we are trying to run, you know, like say internet training on Volta, we found that it's running so fast that everything else is lagging behind. Image pre-processing on the CPU is lagging behind. Disk is lag lagging behind. Copying things is not fast enough. We just need to, you know, like optimize the whole stack to make sure that we catch up with the awesome progress that the, uh, the uh, uh, neural processing side has been doing. So that's memory. And the operator side. And it seems that every new paper comes with a new operator, right? And uh, for us, basically the task is how do we implement those kind of operators as fast as possible 
as efficient as possible because we don't really want to write a very slow operator and then that becomes the bottleneck of the whole machine learning stack. And also with all those kinds of devices that we support, for example, in Facebook, we support you know, Linux platforms for the server side. We do Android, we do on, you know, like on iOS, and we do you know, like embedded devices and things like that. So across all those devices, how to write these operators efficiently and fast becomes pretty interesting. And if we have you know, like new hardware chips and things like that, how do we um, make sure that the software stack makes people more easy to write those kind of uh, operators? Now, Today, there is you know, just way too many standards, allowing me to like, rent a little bit. On the CPU side, you know, like, um, not even mentioning writing SSE, AVX, AVS2, and things like that. We have CUDA, which everyone loves. It's so easy to, to program. We have HIP coming up. We have OpenCL, OpenGL, Metal, Vulkan, <coughs> RenderScript, and all those kind of things coming up as different programming languages for uh, writing operators. And if you think about it, it's kind of, you know, like, oddly similar but annoyingly different, right? On the right, what I'm showing is a uh, CUDA kernel for running value and an OpenCL kernel for running value. Essentially, they're just like that effective line of output equals to input chopping off the negative part is the same. The other thing is are just doing scaffolding and scaffolding and scaffolding. So how do we make it, you know, um, more uniform and uh, avoid us rewriting every, for every single platform. That's kind of like something that's, uh, that's interesting to us. Now, we were thinking about you know, what kind of patterns that we need in these kind of things. It seems that often it pretty much just boils down to three type of operations. One is element operations, such as value, exponentials, logs, and things like that. One is broadcasting. You know, for example, we want to take a matrix and then take another matrix with one within dimension and broadcast that to like, the other dimensions. And reduction, you know, like um, doing a sum over specific axes or basically um, doing like major multiplication type reductions. And uh, to take one example, instance normalization is one, um, is one uh, layer or one operator that pops up recently in a, in a neural star transfer networks and things like that. It's very simple. We take in a three dimensional tensor, the number of channels times the, number, the height and width of an image, and then we compute the per channel mean. Of, um, of, the, of the input, we compute the, the, the sigma or the, or the standard deviations, and then we basically normalize the output so that you know, like they are uh, contrast normalized in some way. And then I challenge you to read that on the right, which is the actual implementation of instance normalization. I just explained to you in three lines of equations how it should be done. And then you know, like I'm pretty sure that no one is able to get anything out like in half, an, a, half a minute in that long chunk of code. And I made it int intentional because it's a very small font. Um, and it falls to three very basic categories, right? Reduction and then, you know, like basically like um, doing division and uh, with broadcast. Now, I think then basically, you know, like maybe we were thinking a possible solution is going towards compilers. And compiler is basically this notion that has been like really loosely defined. And potentially, you know, like a compiler such as TVM that Tianqi mentioned just now um, can potentially help us to produce different backends. We just need to write the abstraction of math and it's able to give us, you know, different implementations. Potentially, it can give us more easier abstractions. We just need to write, you know, in the normalization case, maybe just like some and some and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, broadcast and things like that. Hopefully, and that's actually one thing that's like we care a lot, is hopefully these kind of compilers can give us a very high efficiency. Now, for example, Halide has been a really awesome, um, I guess, IRN compiler for image processing. And it has been used very widely, and if I recall correctly, Google Camera uses that quite a lot for very fast and efficient image processing. And it turns out that Halide has some constraints in you know, like doing deep learning computations, and that's kind of something that we can potentially improve further. Um, and this may also be critical when we're thinking about new hardware because you know, if for every new hardware we need to write that 100 operators, it might be a bit uh, embarrassing. But if we can have an IR and basically say, we just need to write yet another backend for these compilers, that makes things really nice for us. And there's also a bunch of things that compilers can do. Um, machine learning systems today, if, I, if you think about it, it works kind of similar to an interpreter. <laughs> During prediction time, what we do is we load that network and then we have an abstract term called operator. And then this operator gets overloaded with different special instantiations. And what we do is we run this operator, followed by this operator, followed by this operator, and things like that. And uh, you know, like it doesn't really take into consideration the specific characteristics of the network. 
for example, when we are deploying a CNN or an MLP, often the shape of all those input and the parameters are fixed. Even often the um, parameters are fixed as well. Which basically means that we could, we could actually inline a lot of computations and you know, like doing a lot more op optimizations than a general engine that assumes nothing. And here's a code snippet, snippet I found in Eigen, which is doing tensor contraction. Now, this line is particularly interesting. Um, because you know, it's basically saying, I don't really know what its input shape is, so I'll have to basically have this branch over there during, uh, that during runtime basically makes, like, makes uh, choices of what kind of actual um, program that I'll run. And these kind of things happen in almost every single layer in the uh, machine learning runtimes today. And imagine as we speak, these kind of code is running you know, billions of times. And it's probably something that we could optimize away. Not saying Eigen is a bad library. It's a great library for us to do vectorizations and things like that. But you know, by throwing in more specific ML characteristics, we can potentially do much better. And uh, there are you know, like examples in the industry using different kind of ways for us to do completion and to do optimizations. And NVIDIA's TensorRT is a pretty great example. If we think about CNNs, then you know, like value is just one unnecessary operator because all it does is reads everything into the memory and then chop off the negative part, super tiny operations, throw it out, just wasting memory overhead, right? And then you know, TensorRT is, for example, is able to basically like um, combine all those operators into one inline in computation sentence like that. And um, well, um, our, um, you know, like um, we've tried the TensorRT and uh, you know, like we hope that there will be like more general solutions that pops up that we can co-develop and things like that. I think, you know, like XLA is a good, great example. TVM is another one. And hopefully, you know, like we can collectively start to, you know, like develop on this front more proactively so that ML can be optimized at a higher level. Um, I just already talked about this. so. No worries about that. And arithmetics, which is the last part that I wanted to talk about and which is the most confusing part that, uh, that I have the least idea about. Now, um, we already know that uh, having lower bits and things like that has very clear benefits, you know, like um, the, uh, the amount of Pico drills needed to write, uh, to, to compute, like say a fixed ad versus a float ad is very starkly different. And also, you know, like with smaller, uh, with smaller bit widths, then we save a lot of memory access, which is another key um, source of the power consumption. Now, the thing is, you know, like, are we able to convert all those models to reduce precision? That's kind of like the high level question, right? And when we look through the literature, it seems that the answer is yes and no. Um, a lot of models, especially you know, like those classification models, um, you know, like doing image classification and things like that, are pretty fine with int 8 and even with lower bits such as 4 bits and 2 bits. And uh, uh, that also kind of plugs into like, you know, like, um, whether we do um, reduced precision for storage only or we do reduced precision for computation. And we're talking about computation here. Now, a lot of the applications still seems to be needed in Flow 16. And for all those AR applications, such as Neostar Transfer, seems that Flow 16 is um, still needed to maintain a good quality. During training, things seems to be still an issue. Um, we kind of uh, basically tried um, Pascal training, or um, we kind of uh, tried to you know, like train FE16 at ImageNet with, uh, with, uh, with Pascal, and that has you know, like FE16 accumulation in between. It seems that it's pretty challenging because you, know, like, um, you have um, Value is basically being too small and things like that. And um, FE16 IO and FE32 accumulation seems to be a, a reasonable approach in Volta that works perfectly well. For quantized training, then things get a little bit more, you know, like um, a little bit more um, random in the sense that you know they often um, introduce a little bit of a, a, a performance re reduction, such as in Torfanet, it's like about two percent or so. In XNORNet, it's about ten percent or so. I haven't really uh, like um, looked at the most recent update, so. My apologies if things are a bit off. They're having really great speed ups. Um, but then depending on different applications, some of the applications really don't want to tolerate any level of performance loss. So those kind of things like the jury's due out. Um, it's, uh, it's a trade off and a pretty active research field. One thing I was thinking about is you know, like if we have a simulator that can tell us and um, machine learning researchers, if you use this bit, then you know, like you'll be able to get these kind of mathematical results and things like that. And if that simulator could be really fast, then that would create us a very good playground to try out all kinds of crazy ideas and things like that. Because one good property of machine learning is that we can tune almost everything in terms of you know, like bit width, model size, and things like that to try better performances. Right now, it's a little bit tricky because you know, like um, it's hard for us to implement reduced precision um, math especially efficiently. So a simulator would really help quite a lot here. 
And then there are also kind of like pretty um, like open questions such as, you know, like can we do inheritance sloppy maths? We don't really have to stick with uh, IEEE um, 754 format. Maybe we can do float, but then, you know, like just like make sure that every time we do computation, it's, uh, it's accurate to some extent, plus minus two or three percent or something, something like that. Maybe we could do non-conventional mentees and exponent bits. And we know that float 16 has, you know, like five bits for exponentials. Sometimes maybe it's not needed, um, or sometimes it's like it, we need more about that to cope for the like large range of um, um, uh, the scale in during training time. And uh, one thing that was pretty interesting is, you know, for example, for sparse embedding tables and things like that, it's pretty much memory bound. So. And for whatever kind of bit width that we can use, potentially we can just use it and uh, leave all those unpacking tasks to the uh, CPUs and cache, and that potentially still comes for free. So these kind of things, you know, will be pretty interesting directions to look into, and uh, having a playground and uh, have more research directions into that would be uh, would be pretty nice. So in the end, um, like when I, when I was. Uh, um, up in the air and flying here, I kind of drew up this. There's compiler questions, there's arithmetic questions, there's operator questions, and there's memory questions. They probably interact with each other and they kind of like help um, each other to kind of like, like define what the next machine learning systems and hardware could be. So I'm really excited to be like here and then you know, like talk about, uh, talk about this and, uh, and hopefully engage more conversations with hardware experts on what kind of things we can do. And lastly, I want to basically quote this um, from, uh, from uh, Forbes in 2005, what Andy gives, Bill takes away. It's pretty nice that, you know, like everything that Andy, Andy Groves um, provides, then Bill is able to come up with very nice software innovations that takes over these kind of innovation, uh, like these kind of capabilities. We seem to be doing the same as well. Machine learning seems to be a sponge that takes in any kind of computation power that we have and just iterate it to a much better um, um, machine learning system. And, uh, you know, um, Bill still wants more, and uh, let's see what Andy can offer. Thanks a lot. Question. Do we have questions? So. Steve. Uh, yeah, at the very end of your talk, just a couple of slides ago, you were talking about um, uh, memory bound using an arbitrary number of bits. Yeah. Can, can you go back and elaborate a little more on what you were trying to say there? I didn't quite get that. Yeah, so, um, you know, like, for example, let's see, let's say we're doing an sparse embedding table. Now, the default way is basically just to have a float table, right? And then just, like, store the float numbers over there. We know that if we reduce it to, like, float 16, things probably would work as well. Um, but then, you know, like, on, on Imagine if we can just like, if we mathematically know that nine bits is good enough, then we can basically just like store things in nine bits with, you know, like bit shift and things like that. Now, what our conjecture is, um, is that um, that would still be fine. You know, like the CPU will pay a higher cost of unpacking those values because now you need to, you know, like do bit shift to recover the actual numbers. But if these kind of things are memory bound anyway, then, you know, like bit width is probably the more important part to optimize for. And then if we spend a little bit more CPU cycles, it's probably fine. Yeah, thanks. Question right here. Yeah. So you, you showed some nice picture of um, speed up linear uh, scaling with larger uh, number of GPUs. Mm -hmm. And you said that uh, it's okay to have pretty large mini batch sizes, I guess, to accommodate that. Yeah. Uh, I guess it was the, the other figure, but anyways. So, um, I mean, my experience is that large mini batch sizes also come with a price in terms of convergence speed. So, uh, would you comment on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, the question is about the convergence speed versus batch size. And I think um, this is kind of something that's you know, like a little bit tricky to figure out. And sometimes, well, in general, the feeling is that with larger batch sizes, we get uh, you know, like worse convergence speed. And there's like, uh, some really nice papers in iClear talking about that. In the specific case of ImageNet and uh, most of the image models, what we found is that we can basically have a strategy for like warm start in the, uh, the learning procedure by having smaller learning rates and linearly increase it to the common like learning rate that we used to have. And uh, that, make, uh, that seems to be giving us a very nice burn-in kind of period for kicking off the, the, the optimization. And that basically gives us an almost the same weak scaling and strong scaling numbers. And for other models, then um, we, we haven't really tried it in like very big LSTM and um, MT models and things like that. For image models, it seems to be working across the board well. Okay. 
one question there in the back. Wait. Go ahead. Hi, so thank you for the excellent presentation. Uh, I was wondering, uh, so at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned that uh, you know Winograd is the way to go for convolution, uh, but we had a lot of talks about using reduced precision, you know, one-bit integers, and um, are these uh, quantization techniques compatible with optimizations like the Winograd transform, and how do you balance these uh, two different uh, ways forward? Yeah, um, so the question is like how to balance like quantized computation and other optimization techniques with, you know, like uh, mathematical approaches such as Winograd. And it's a pretty open question and we really don't know and often, you know, like what happens is we basically manually tune the, uh, well, try out the different runtimes and figure out which one is the fastest to run. Even for Winograd, for example, um, if the batch size is one, it sometimes gets slower than integral approaches. Um, and uh, I think you know, like there are some general guidelines or like general you know like um, heuristics that we have about designing neural networks. And one example is you know like um, there was a research on how to do separable filters such as um, decomposing a three by three filter to three by one and one by three because that mathematically reduces computation power or well, computation needs by thirty three percent. And in practice, it sometimes doesn't really work that well because you know now you're paying a memory cost and things like that. And it, feel, it seems that three by three convolutions in practice often works really well from an engineering perspective. And then often that's run by Winograd. Oh, I have um, a quick question. Could you go back to the arithmetic slide, the one yeah. that Steve was pointing to? Um, so when you say, okay, so uh, lower, um, fewer bits and more sloppier arithmetic, Oh, this one, yeah. Yeah. So do you think you can also tolerate non-deterministic arithmetic operations and also non-deterministic memory behavior? My gut feeling is, uh, is yes. And at some point, we did like a pretty cute experiment, which is like trying to like throw in some low-level noises into the network. It seems to be like still pretty stable and doesn't affect the final result too much. I see. And did you do that both doing training and inference or just doing inference? Or just, just doing inference, actually. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I have a question too. So you had a slide which was about custom ops, basically, and yeah. you were saying that every researcher wants to add actually a new custom op. So if I go back to some of the systematic or at least the statistical exploration techniques that Vincent mentioned, do you think there is a chance that we can show that maybe these custom ops are not necessary and that models based on the more original set of primitives will do well, or that these ops are really going to edge out the uh, more traditional neural networks? Um, yeah, so basically I think the question is, you know, like new operators versus like set of primitives that can construct operators more easily, right? I think, um, so there's actually this like very interesting, you know, like um, like debate between having coarse grain operators versus fine grain operators. And coarse grain such as having batch normalization being one chunk of operator. And then a fine grain operator meaning, you know, like having addition and like subtraction, reduction and things like that to construct batch normalization. And it seems that you know, like, um, we will be needing a good compiler to do really fine-grained operations because then you know, like, if we literally run the fine-grained operations one by one, then the memory becomes a huge issue. Um, it's only when we can combine those operations during compile time then we can get good speed. And as a result, a lot of you know, like, um, critically needed operat operators today, such as BN, seems to be manually, turned, well, manually tuned quite a bit nowadays. Um, but hopefully with better compilers, then we'll be going the other way, which is mathematically easier. Thank you. If there is no other question, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks so much. <laughs>